The second panel that will start now has uh, the topic, how can the rule of law be secured in Europe? It's more forward-looking. And uh, as moderator for the second panel, we have the publisher of the Verfassungs blog, the constitutional blog, Maximilian Steinbeis. He is here in the Bremen uh, representation, and you will see him in a moment. He worked for 10 years as an uh, editor for Handelsblatt uh, on a political side and is today a free publisher uh, for law and publishing. And in 2019, he started the Verfassungs blog in order to deal with legal and constitutional topics uh, at home and abroad. He has become this has become one of a key author's blog uh, discussing important matters also in the context of European integration. We are very pleased now, however, for the uh, second panel as a co-debater, uh, but also as an opening speaker to welcome the Commissioner of Justice of the European Commission, Didier Reinders, uh, who joins us from Brussels. Um, he is a lawyer and has held many roles in his life. I don't want to or can't relate to in this time. In 1992, uh, he uh, went for the uh, Alonian uh, Liberal Party to the Belgian Chamber of Deputies. And he, we know him uh, that between uh, 1999 and 2011, he was a Belgian finance minister and then uh, was a member of three governments in Belgium as a foreign minister. Since the 1st of December 2019, he is a commissioner for justice and rule of law in the commission of Ursula von der Leyen. Mr. Randers, we're pleased to have you. Over to you. Yeah, they have. Well, once more, we have some connection problems in this case with the Commission in Brussels, and we hope to be able uh, to resolve that soon. And this is why we would rather now get into the panel discussion that was planned. The moderator, Maximilian Steinbeis, had already been announced by me. Um, besides Didier Reinders, who will also be on the panel, uh, we have got uh, Irina Speck. Uh, she's responsible for policy matters in the uh, German Foreign Office. A warm welcome. Then also the two hosts, the Polish Ombudsman, Professor Dr. Bortmann and uh, my uh, colleague in the German Institute of uh, uh, Human Rights on uh, the board, Professor Dr. Rodolf and Mrs. Adamowicz, member of the European uh, Parliament, and she is uh, the wife of the uh, murdered Gdansk uh, mayor. For the uh, moderation, I pass the floor to Maximilian Steinbass, who will facilitate the panel. Now, over to you. Um, kind words of introduction. Um, I guess we st three months into the corona crisis, we're still treading uncertain grounds uh, in these kind of um, um, hybrid uh, conferences, Zoom meeting kind of things. So um, um, we'll, without further ado, jump rightly into uh, jump right into the panel discussion. And um, I would like, since our, our topic for for this uh, discussion is what to expect of the a um, uh, uh, German uh, council presidency, uh, which is about to begin. Um, um, I would like to direct uh, my first question to the representative of the German uh, government, uh, Irina Speck. Um, the council hasn't struck me as particularly eager to pick a fight with a member state uh, and its government, which undermines the rule of law in recent years in the EU so far, to say the least. And um, is this going to change on the German Council presidency? And if so, how? Thank you very much for including me into this panel. And it's really um, sad that Commissioner Reynas couldn't give his keynote speech, because I think he would also lay the ground for what we will take up when we, um, when we take over the German Council presidency next week. Um, so what I can tell you is that the rule of law will be very high on the agenda of the Council presidency. And this is for very obvious reasons. Rule of law is not a nice to have, but is sine qua no condition for the functioning of the EU. Rule of law is the safeguard of safeguards and, and um, in the end, the foundation stone of our shared um, rules-based community in Europe. We've seen this urgently in the last month of crisis when the rule of law got under pressure also in the, in the EU. This is the moment in which we really need to demonstrate how serious we are about the rule of law. So under our council presidency, we will focus on several strands, and that's maybe already um, coming to your first question. One strand will be the Article 7 procedures against Poland and Hungary. Where there's a deficit in compliance with the rule of law, the mechanisms envisaged in the European treaties must be resolutely employed. 
that applies both to proceedings in, in accordance with Article 7 of the Treaty on the European Union and to proceedings before the European Court of Justice. We will support the Commission and the European Parliament in the Article 7 procedures they have launched with respect to Poland and Hungary. The second strand we will focus on is um, EU budgetary funding, funding um, and its compliance with rule of law standards. Um, that's why we will be also working to see the provision of EU funds more strongly tied to the adherence to the principle of the rule of law. This will play an important role in the upcoming negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework once the heads of state of government have concluded their position as the council. Compliance with rule of law standards in the EU and its member states is a basic prerequisite for the correct use of funding from the EU budget. The mechanism, and I'm sure um, um, Commissioner Reynos would have elaborated on that or will later do so, the mechanism would apply if there are general deficiencies of the rule of law in a member state that endangers the budgetary management in relation to EU funds. The Commission could then take measures to address the problems including reducing or restricting funding in a proportionate manner. We support the Commission in this endeavour in making EU budgetary funding dependent on compliance with rule of law standards in the Member States. When you look at the, the instruments I just elaborated on, you can see they are all corrective measures. They only take effect once the fundamental principle of the rule of law has already been clearly violated. But what's missing so far is a preventive mechanism, a forward-looking and cooperative mechanism involving all member states in the same way and on equal footing, a mechanism that allows for a constructive dialogue among, among equals in order to learn from each other and create mutual understanding about how to best deal with rule of law issues, a mechanism that prevents the difficult situations from even arriving. This is what we would like to put on track in the Council and our presidency. What we want to create is a preventive instrument that will enable us to engage in an open and constructive dialogue about the rule of law, as we have not seen that before. And that is where the work of the Commission and the plans for our presidency come together. The Commission announced that it will present its first um, an annual rule of law report in September. <laughs> It, so maybe, I don't know if Commissioner Reynas is coming in now. Ah, yes. Sorry, please go. Um, um, I just said that you will present your first annual rule of law report um, in September. And you clearly expected the Council and the European Parliament to provide a comprehensive follow-up. As presidency, we feel we bear a particular responsibility as we said, uh, we will set a precedent for future presidencies on how the Council deals with the Commission's report. So on the basis of the Commission's first annual rule of law report covering all member states, we want to start a regular, open and critical rule of law dialogue in the Council. Developments across Europe will be addressed, as will all country-specific chapters. In this me mechanism, all member states will submit themselves to a recipro reciprocal review of their rule of law. It will take the form of two discu discussions, and that's how we envisage this. An annual one on the report as a whole um, and its horizontal aspects, and a half yearly one on the first country-specific chapters of the report, so that all member states, step by step and in turn, will be covered. Our goal is to foster a better understanding of the situation in each member state identifying um, risk at an early stage and being in a position to offer reciprocal support. We believe that looking not only at cross-cutting issues, but also providing for a country-specific discussion is particularly important because rule of law issues are typically not the same all over Europe. They are very specific to the, to the judicial, constitutional and political systems and traditions of every single member state. Um, Judge Majdowski said this earlier on in the first panel. So we would like to give every member state the possibility to explain the developments mentioned in the Commission's report in the context of its own traditions and its system. During our presidency, we want to put a focus on this forward-looking constructive dialogue amongst equals because we deeply believe that we should return the rule of law to what it ought to be, 
not something that divides us in Europe, but really that unites us in Europe, a culture of rule of law, or to put it with um, Judge Maidowski's words, rule of law is all of us. That's how he started his speech in the first panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, introduction. Um, I understand that um, um, Commissioner Reinders is now with us, and um, we already have heard from him briefly. And the floor is yours, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, if you hear me, I will uh, maybe um, explain how we are working about uh, the, our capacity to uphold the rule of law and um, in all the member states at the EU level. I will be very pleased to see that uh, it will be with the support of the future German presidency. And uh, it was very uh, useful to listen to the way to organize the German presidency in the next month. And of course, um, the rule of law, you know, that is uh, one of uh, the fundamental values of the European Union enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. What makes the, the rule of law so important is that it guarantees the respect of all other values, including democracy and fundamental rights. In fact, it's the European way of life. It's that the real uh, definition in the Article 2 of the Treaty. I'm particularly pleased to discuss about the rule of law in an event organized by national human rights institutions, which have a key role in upholding the rule of law and fundamental rights in the member states. National human rights institutions are essential for making the rule of law and the charter for of fundamental rights a reality for all. They monitor the situation at national level, provide advice to governments and parliaments, investigate, adopt recommendations, and engage in strategic litigation. They can help citizens, in particular those more vulnerable, to know more about their rights and how to enforce them. And so they carry out important education and awareness raising activities. As you know, Recent developments in Europe have put the rule of law uh, on top of the EU agenda. And I'm aware that in certain member states, national human rights institutions have also experienced blows to their independence and effective operations over the past few years. These developments raise important questions. Let me start by recalling that the Organization of Justice is a competence of the member states, who are required to comply with EU law when exercising this competence. Safeguarding the rule of law is therefore, the, in the first place, the responsibility of each member state. However, the Commission also has a responsibility for the rule of law in the Union. And the Commission already has what is often referred to as a rule of law toolbox. Such tools include, for instance, the country-specific recommendations in the European semester, or the EU Justice Scoreboard, which provides comparative information on national justice systems in the EU as regards the independence, quality, and efficiency. And we will publish the next uh, Justice Scoreboard next month, in July. There is also the well-known possibility to launch infringement proceedings where EU law has been breached. In recent years, we have seen the European Court of Justice develop an important case law in this regard, where it emphasizes the link between the rule of law and respect of EU law. But it is clear that we need to do more and think outside of the traditional toolbox. Last year, the Commission therefore launched an important reflection process the result was a communication by the Commission in July 2019, focusing on three themes. First, we need to promote a rule of law culture among the general public. Second, we have to prevent rule of law problems from emerging or deteriorating. And third, response, we need to reflect on the ways how to react more effectively to significant problems. From day one, President von der Leyen committed to carry on this work forward. Today, I will focus on what that means concretely. As regards promotion, building a rule of law culture is about making EU citizens better aware 
of what the rule of law actually means for them. This requires further efforts to improve knowledge in the general public about the rule of law standards and requirements set by EU law. National human rights institutions can play a valuable role in this context, including through the organization of debates such as this one today. I'm also grateful for the dedicated work of journalists and academic fora on this topic, such as the Verfassungsblock in Germany. The Commission is committed to support stakeholders and civil society in their efforts. Our justice funds provide important support for a number of civil society organizations. And uh, I'm happy that in the Commission's draft budget for 2021, which, which the College adopted this week, we have avoided cuts in this fund. So it will be possible to continue to provide support to the civil society and to any organization in such a kind of process. The second major part of our work is about prevention. This is about detecting and remedying rule of law issues at an early stage. To do this, we need a better understanding of the situation of the rule of law in the whole European Union. This is what uh, the new comprehensive European rule of law mechanism is all about. As Justice Commissioner, I have the honor to lead the Commission's work on this file. As part of this new mechanism, I'm coordinating the Commission's work on the first annual rule of law report, which will cover all 27 EU member states on an equal footing. Our services are monitoring significant developments, both positive and negative, in four areas. The justice systems, the anti-corruption framework, certain issues related to media pluralism, and other institutional issues related to checks and balances. In this framework, we are also monitoring the situation of independent authorities, including national human rights institutions. Finally, and where relevant, the report will also reflect recent developments with regard to emergency measures adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic. So far, we have received written input from all EU member states, but also from over 200 stakeholders. Classical one, like the Fundamental Rights Agency in Vienna or the Council of Europe, but also many organizations in all the member states coming from the civil society. This includes, of course, uh, the contribution from the European network of national human rights institutions. I know that both the Polish Commissioner for Human Rights and the German Institute for Human Rights have also provided valuable inputs. As a next step, my services have, in recent weeks, been conducting virtual country visits in each member state including Germany and Poland. I'm grateful for the more than 300 meetings with national authorities and stakeholders, which were cooperative, open, and informative. In this context, my services also had a very insightful exchange with Mr. Bodnar on the current situation in Poland. Thanks to all the input received, we are making good progress and remain on track to publish the report in September as planned. Once the report has been adopted by the College, it will then serve as a basis for the incoming German presidency of the Council to quick start a genuine political debate on the rule of law between the member states in the Council. And I thank the future German presidency for the support to organize such a debate, maybe first on, uh, a general, with a general approach on the uh, annual report, and then member state by member state during uh, the presidency and maybe during the next presidency, for example, with Portugal at the beginning of next year. This political debate also needs to take place in the European Parliament and in the member states, notably in national parliaments and with civil society. I can assure you that I'm fully committed to do that. It will be the best way to try to install a real culture of the rule of law in all the member states and in the civil societies of all the member states. National human rights institutions will have an important role to play in sparking a debate around the report at national level. And I count on your support in this regard. The aim is to start a regular 
annual cycle and provide the impetus for the EU to address challenges for the rule of law in a cooperative way. Let us now turn to our third strand of work, the response. Our work on establishing a better rule of law culture in the EU and on preventing problems from emerging cannot replace remedial action where it becomes necessary. Let me start with infringement proceedings, where the independence of the justice system of a, of a member state has come under threat, the Commission can bring infringement proceedings against this state. For instance, to protect judicial independence in Poland, the Commission has seized the Court of Justice a number of times, and each time with success. Let me say a few words regarding the ongoing infringement proceedings against Poland. On 10 October 2019, the Commission decided to refer Poland to the Court of Justice regarding the new disciplinary regime for judges. The reason was that this regime undermines judicial independence by not offering the safeguard to protect Polish judges from political control. On 14 January 2020, the Commission decided to ask the Court of Justice to impose interim measures on Poland, ordering it to suspend the functioning of the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. On 8 April 2020, the Court of Justice ruled that Poland must immediately suspend the application of national provisions on the powers of the disciplinary chamber. The order, which confirms in full the position of the Commission, applies until the Court will have rendered its final judgment. On 8 May 2020, the Polish authorities provided the Commission with a report that set out the measures taken for implementing the interim order of the Court. After carrying out an analysis of this report, the Commission was not in a position to conclude that Poland had, take, had taken all the necessary steps to comply with the order. For this reason, on 5th June 2020, I sent a letter to the Polish Minister of Justice in which I explained our concerns and asked for clarification and further information from Poland by 24 June 2020. We have received a response at night yesterday. Moreover, as regards the Polish uh, law on the judiciary, the new Polish law on the judiciary, the so-called Muzzle Law, the College decided on 29 April 2020 to open a new infringement procedure. We have carried out a careful analysis of the legislation concerned. On that basis, we conclude that certain provisions adversely affect judicial independence, the principle of primacy of EU law, functioning of the preliminary, preliminary ruling mechanism, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and the General Data Protection Regulation. The Polish government still has until the end of this month to reply to our letter of formal notice. But the EU has also other means to keep up the pressure to protect the rule of law. One is the procedure set out in Article 7 of the Treaty on the European Union. This procedure can be triggered where there is a clear risk of a serious breach by a member state of the values referred to in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union, values which include, of course, the rule of law. This procedure provides for the most serious sanction the EU can impose on a member state. I mean, the suspension of its voting rights in the Council. The launch of this procedure, first against Poland by the Commission and then against Hungary by the European Parliament, is an unprecedented step in the history of the Union. I'm convinced that the Article 7 procedures should continue as long as, this, as the situation points to serious and systemic threats to the rule of law in these member states. Even though this contribution, uh, this contributes to keeping uh, political pressure on the member states concerned, Article 7 can only be one tool among others. One reason for this is, as you know, that 
that its voting procedures to adopt recommendations or sanctions in the Council are particularly demanding. The last reactive instrument of our toolbox is not yet operational. This is a proposal for a mechanism to protect the EU budget in case of breaches of the rule of law in the Member States. It is currently being examined by the European Parliament and the Council. If this proposal is adopted, it could make a very important contribution to protecting the rule of law in the EU. In this respect, I also count on the support of the incoming German presidency, because it will be very important to organize such a conditionality between the funding of different policies and the rule of law. And certainly, if we have an agreement on the new MFF and the next generation AU, because that means that we will spend maybe more money, faster, and with more flexibility than in the past. So it's very important to organize a real protection of the EU budget. We will do that with the installation of the European Public Prosecutor Office, but we need also to do that with a real conditionality between the rule of law and uh, the funding of the different policies. And of course, I said that we have some problems in the use of Article 7 due to uh, the procedural rules and the uh, qualified majority or unanimity that is required in some steps in the Article 7 process is the reason why I insist on the fact that uh, about the conditionality uh, and the new legislative proposal is, of, is of course, uh, important to uh, work with the reverse qualified majority to have a certainty that it will be possible to use uh, such an instrument. In conclusion, if I may, uh, let me uh, say that uh, uh, the Commission remains committed to use all tools at its disposal to uphold the rule of law in our union. We are just uh, uh, added some new tools. We don't want to, su to suppress anyone, so we'll continue to work with infringement proceedings, with dialogue, with Article 7, with all the different tools at our disposal. We have just uh, from September a new tool with the annual report and maybe another new tool with the conditionality uh, related to the uh, MFF and the financing of different policies. National human rights institutions are important partners for the Commission in this regard, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss with you today, and maybe uh, just uh, a last word to say that when we will have uh, uh, published the uh, annual report on the rule of law in September, I said it will be important to discuss with the German presidency at the council level, to discuss also in the European Parliament this report, but also to go to uh, the different member states to discuss at the national level with the parliaments, with the civil society. And again, I count on the national human rights institutions to take part in such a process and to help us to install a real culture of the rule of law in all the member states. Thank you very much for your invitation, of course, and your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Reynders, for this uh, keynote. Um, I understand you have to leave early, so um, um, uh, let's um, uh, swiftly proceed uh, uh, with our uh, panel discussion. Um, Ombudsman Bodnar, um, <clears throat> uh, we all, I think we all are aware of the sensitivities which exist in, in, in Poland towards what some may consider German attempts to meddle with uh, uh, Polish internal affairs, which is high for obvious reasons. And um, to which extent do you think the German Council presidency um, will have to tread lightly when it comes to rule of law issues in Poland? And what in general are you uh, expecting, um, uh, what are the expectations of the, of the Polish people, of the citizens um, um, of, of these six months to come in your uh, view. First of all, I want maybe to, yeah, please. Uh, okay, Maximilian, so who's floor? Who is having the floor right now? Me or the sure, Commission? Sure, Mr. Badnar, please. No, no, please, okay. Mr. Badnar. Okay, fantastic. Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation to participate in this uh, important uh, conference. And I would like to thank our uh, partners from the German Institute for Human Rights for making it happen. Uh, I'm very uh, happy that I can speak after uh, Commissioner Reinders uh, and his uh, statements concerning the plans for the Commission. And it seems to me the, the most important point is that the German presidency basically should 
work together and should cooperate with the Commission on the on issues concerning rule of law. I think it is of utmost importance that there is a cooperation and that there is a, a strategy, because after all those years, more or less, we know what works and what doesn't work. And maybe I would I would like to concentrate on some of those uh, issues. First of all, I would like to say that I'm just uh, fi almost five years in service as the Ombudsman. So my term comes to an end. And I remember that basically uh, there were like two major topics during my uh, term. One topic was rule of law, and it is still an ongoing issue, as you know. Uh, and second is something what I would name as so-called attempt to make an illiberal change in uh, in Poland and trying to resist this uh, illiberal change. And just recently, we observed like another step in this process concerning protection of LGBTI rights. But I would like to follow to what Professor Grubel said about this need to explain the value of rule of law and the protection of constitutional rights to our citizens. Over my term, I have visited more than 200 Polish cities where I had meetings some with some delay and some issues where I had meetings with uh, citizens and I really believe that they need to have a deep understanding why they do have rights why those rights are important for them and why uh, they shouldn't allow for those rights to be taken over from uh, from them so we really need to invest a lot of time energy and our uh, let's say creativity, how to push uh, uh, for the proper civic education and education on rights. I think we shouldn't forget about this uh, value. Second point, uh, for sure, you know, I will not go into details concerning all those institutional changes that happened in Poland, but I think this so-called, uh, the famous theory of salami slices uh, is applicable here. So over those last five years, we observed the process of cutting of the independence of different uh, institutions. And uh, of course, uh, European Union has been intertwined in different processes, but also especially in terms of, of uh, reaction. And I think one of the major lessons we are having is that uh, the ruling majority in Poland is basically taking the advantage of the time. Because after a couple of months, uh, after a couple of years from some initial changes, it is much more difficult to deinstall or to stop any changes that have been made in the uh, legal system. Just look at the National Council of Judiciary. We have this discussion about expulsion of the Polish National Council of Judiciary from the European network of councils of judiciary, but it is uh, it takes time. Uh, and it is also quite difficult to stop the operation of the organ, which is having this um, primordial uh, scene uh, in terms of being composed uh, with the huge influence of the executive uh, power. And in the meantime, the National Council is taking a lot of decisions. And it seems to me that if you look back, like the good uh, and important lesson for us is 2018, when uh, upon uh, the... Mm, uh, infringement action of the European Commission and later on interim order of the Court of Justice, it was possible to uh, stop the process of sending uh, judges for early retirement from the Polish Supreme Court. That was really a great success, 19th October 2018, when this interim measure has stopped the process of really detrimental changes in the, uh, in the Supreme Court and 20 judges could return uh, uh, to adjudication. Right now, obviously, we are in a much more different and more complicated moment. Uh, because first of all, uh, we know that the judgment of 19th November 2019, which challenged the process of nomination of judges made by the National Council of Judiciary, this judgment to great extent has been challenged by the Polish authorities as a result of adoption of so-called muzzle law. Uh, it's good that muzzle law is subject to uh, of attention of the European Commission, and then the infringement action has started. And I really do count that uh, after this exchange of letters, and we can almost predict what is in those letters, uh, sooner or later this case and this law will end up in the Court of Justice of the European Union. But I think we should be concerned with uh, two other issues. Uh, the first issue is whether the interim order by the Court of Justice concerning disciplinary chamber and disciplinary 
judges uh, in the Supreme Court is really enforced. Because my feeling is that uh, this judgment is simply not enforced at all, uh, at all. And moreover, some actions by the authorities which are taken are just obvious uh, uh, declaration of lack of willingness of any compliance with this judgment. Just recently, Judge Tuleya, one of the most famous uh, Polish judges, has been subject to the procedure concerning lifting of the judicial uh, immunity uh, by the disciplinary chamber. Uh, and it happened just two months after the issuance of the, uh, of the interim measure. I think it is really important because if uh, the European Union is allowing that uh, the EU law is basically ignored or basically it is used uh, uh, or it is applicable uh, uh, on the, based on the principle of cherry picking, uh, it shouldn't be. It is. It, it doesn't mean anything good for the future of the European uh, integration. But in this context, I would like also to mention one another process, which could be especially important in the terms of safeguard, safeguarding rule of law in Europe, which is the use of the European arrest warrant. Uh, after this famous uh, Selmer case, uh, we are at a completely different stage. We are at the stage where certain domestic courts are already refusing to surrender Polish uh, individuals on the basis of the European arrest warrant by referring to problems with the judicial independence. And I think it is the issue for the European Commission, but also for the German presidency, to look at this and to check what are really the consequences uh, for the uh, mutual recognition of judgments and mutual cooperation in legal matters uh, of this problem with the rule of law in, uh, in Poland. I, because the, the recent decision by the Landsgericht in Karlsruhe, in which uh, this court has refused to make a surrender, but also the recent decision of the Slovakian court to also to uh, not to refuse a Polish uh, individual, is uh, really something important from the point of view of uh, future integration. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we are talking about, uh, and I do appreciate the effort by the Commission concerning the annual report uh, on, the, on the rule of law. But I'm, I must say that I'm afraid of one thing, because we can enter into one more additional discussion, one more additional review, one more additional uh, evaluation. But what is at the essence is the time. Because after two, three, four months' time, the situation will be once again much more different than it was. So here, in my opinion, it is important to have something like a strategy, but also a strategy which uh, encompasses uh, a certain effect that should, be, uh, that should be achieved. Like, for example, even if we look back into the Muslim law, uh, I remember that uh, Commissioner Jurova was in Poland in January uh, this year, at the end of January, and we expected that uh, basically the case uh, in the Court of Justice will be pretty soon. And of course, I understand that there are certain procedures uh, for to be completed before the case is turned to the Court of Justice of the European Union. But but it seems to me that in September, reality will be once more uh, a little bit different than it was, uh, let's say, in uh, in spring. And maybe those procedures uh, procedures could be complemented, uh, could be completed uh, earlier. Uh, so I think that uh, that taking the element of time is really important in this in this context. I would like to, uh, to refer also to, to one topic which, which was mentioned in the previous panel, but I think it is of great importance because here on this rule of law scene, we have like another actor. Finally, we have another actor. I mean here, the European Court of Human Rights. European Court of Human Rights uh, is a, might be a crucial actor in safeguarding judicial independence, right to court, uh, but also the situation of uh, preserving the situation of individual judges. And Judge uh, Professor Angelika Nussberger used this nice uh, comparison to the fire brigade, that both the Luxembourg and Strasbourg court could be like a fire brigade. But unfortunately, I can say this about the Court of Justice, that they are really trying to work as a fire brigade by making all those different cases, interim orders, and so on. But it seems to me that with the European Court of Justice, the fire truck has just get out of the fire station and it is still far away from getting to the place of fire. Uh, we have an, a couple of cases that have been communicated, 
but still we don't have even you know some imagination what are the dates of hearings or dates of judgments in those cases and if you have judgments let's say in two three years time from now it, they would really do, they would not really matter you know so th so it is important to take that the European Court of Human Rights should take things in Poland, in Hungary, in other member states of the European Union seriously. Just to conclude, I would like to say that what is at stake now, it's not just the future of, uh, of Poland. Uh, Professor uh, President uh, Małgorzata Gersdorf has used really very dramatic words to describe the uh, situation in Poland. It is a future of European integration because this European integration is based on the mutual recognition of judgments and mutual legal cooperation. It is based on the common protection of European values. But, uh, but it is also, and I would like to underline this, it is also a story of individual judges who are putting uh, at risk their individual careers. You know, we can talk about number of uh, institutional issues. We, are, we can talk about number of solutions, but one of those judges, Judge Justice, the judge who started to apply directly the EU law, has been suspended as a judge, and his salary has been cut by half. So he is one, like a very practical, very concrete, specific example of a judge who is uh, suffering. We have a number of judges who are facing explanatory or disciplinary cases uh, these days. We shouldn't forget about them. We should think that their sacrifice is in order to save not only Polish democracy, but it is in order to save uh, democracy at the European Union uh, level. Uh, so please, uh, let's have it in mind that it is not just an institutional discussion, it is a discussion about real sacrifice and lives of dedicated judges uh, and other civil servants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam Bodnar. Um, you mentioned uh, the fact that uh, uh, the courts, the European courts, the fire brigades have left the station but have, are still far from reaching the, 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 the fire and um, the Article 7 procedure has been around for years now and it's, uh, it's hard to see how they uh, um, um, can proceed uh, in a more pr uh, um, promising way than they have so far. So there's one thing that is really make, making a difference and many uh, uh, place their hopes into that one and that is hitting those governments where it really hurts and which is the money. Um, and both uh, Commissioner Reynas have mentioned and, and, and uh, Ms. Speck have mentioned the proposal about um, uh, making funding from EU with EU money um, uh, conditional with respect for um, uh, human rights and, um, and the rule of law. Um, Professor Rudolf, um, is conditionality really the key to fix this problem? Well, I, I don't think there is one key to um, uh, preserve the rule of law. I think what we need to do is to use all the instruments that are available because the rule of law is so fundamental um, uh, and is the fundament, actually, of the European Union. Can I just add to what Adam Bodnar said, and that is, I, th I think the, the independence of the judiciary is not a question of national sovereignty. It's a question of common European standards and it's a question of our fundamental rights. Um, it is a question, therefore, for all of us. And so, therefore, I think we all in, in Europe have um, to, to act. Um, we all in Europe have a right to an independence judiciary. That is enshrined in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. That's enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights. And I think it's been rightly said that the uh, preserving the independence of the judiciary is key to the future of the EU as a community based on the rule of law and a community of values. Now, um, I think really this is a test of um, adherence to the European values. I think all true Europeans must join hands and use what is at their hands to uphold the rule of law wherever it's challenged in the European Union. Um, I would like to emphasize that it's concerned citizens that must continue to protest to um, attacks on the independence of the judiciary. Um, citizens, the media, national human rights institutions need to hold to account those that undermine the rule of law. And as we've heard, um, judges and prosecutors all over Europe have an uh, instrument at hand. They must reject to apply judgments that are rendered by courts that are not independent. 
and governments individually and collectively must insist that um, the European member states, all European member states, implement the judgment of the Court of Justice um, of the EU. Uh, and the European Commission must continue and step up initiating infringement procedures um, when a state infringes upon the independence of the, uh, the judiciary. And the Commission, national human rights institutions, civil society must monitor the implementation of those judgments and um, the development of the rule of law. And although you were skeptical about the Article 7 procedure on determining whether there is a serious and persistent breach of um, uh, European values, I think it is important to, again, step off that procedure. I think it would be an important uh, message if the, um, the majority of the European Council would emphasize that it is against the spirit of the procedure that any government participates in those procedures if it itself is under um, review. Um, if it's, uh, so that's not in the text. There's only the unanimity versus one. But I think we need to speak out that those governments um, who are themselves under review may not participate in procedures concerning other states. But lastly, as you said, the EU um, must make sure that the funds of the union are only spent in member states that have an independent judiciary. Um, I think we've heard from Commissioner Reinders that this is necessary to protect the funds of the EU. That means it's necessary to protect taxpayers' money. I mean, how can a government explain to its population that their hard-earned money uh, will be spent in another member state without an independent judiciary, without independent control? But I think even more, um, I think it's independent courts protect the people, all people, and not just those that are close to the government. So the European Union should not support financially and a government that withholds independent judicial protection from the people. In my opinion, therefore, this type of conditionality is an applied European solidarity. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, judicial independence is not the only challenge we are facing in the EU right now with respect to the rule of law and, and also to democracy and human rights. Um, Another would be hate speech and disinformation campaigns at the hands of, of, of governments or uh, government-sponsored uh, private actors. And um, this um, brings me to you, Ms. Adamovic. Um, what, in, with respect to the combat against hate speech and disinformation, what would your expectations to the German presidency, council presidency would be? No. Do you hear me? Yes. Just to, to ask if it's possible just to take the floor two minutes because I need to, to leave. So if, I, but I want to react maybe at what was said by Mr. Bodnar and the professor. Two minutes if it's possible. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So I, I want just uh, uh, to, to say that, of course, the professor has said that we need to, uh, to use all tools that we have at our disposal. It's very clear. And of course, it's very important to have the citizens on board in the debates that we are trying to organize about the rule of law. But I want to uh, insist on the fact that I don't want to interfere in the uh, electoral process in Poland for the moment. I want just to make two, three remarks. The first one, uh, about the judges. I fully understand the remark of Mr. Bodnar about the individual judges and the risk that they have taken in the last months and years. And it's one of the reasons why I've asked to the Commission to ask interim measures. And I said we have received yesterday a response from the Minister of Justice and the Minister of uh, European Affairs. Of course, it's uh, now the task of my services to analyze the content of the response, and we will see what is needed to do or not on such a basis in the near future. The second remark, it's about the, the German presidency. Again, I will be very pleased that uh, we will organize a debate about the first annual report on the rule of law during the German presidency, not only in general, but also country by country, member state by member state. It's a real peer review. So it will be, for the first time, a real pressure from the different member states about the rule of law on all the orders. Uh, we will continue to use Article, to, to use article 7. Uh, of course, we know the difficulties that we have with the uh, procedural rules in the Article 7, but we need to continue during the German presidency to use such an instrument. And of course, 
I'm hoping that it will be possible to make some progress, to, to, to do some progress in the uh, conditionality about the funding. And I insist again on the reverse qualified majority in such a process. And my last remark is to say that it's, of course, very important, it was said by Mr. Bodnar, that uh, the EU institution and the Council of Europe play an important role to support the rule of law in all the member states, the sort of two courts, in Luxembourg and in Strasbourg. But it's also important to support a real debate at the national level in all the member states, because without a real discussion with the citizens about the rule of law, it will be difficult to make real progress. Of course, we have some tools at our disposal to try to push pressure, to organize a real process, but we need, again, to have a real debate at the national level. I want just to say that, but sorry, but I, uh, I, I must leave because I have another meeting with uh, some ministers uh, during the Croatian presidency. But uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, seminar, this webinar, and I'm hoping that we will have the opportunity after the publication of our annual report in September to come back and to discuss again at the national level the content of such a first annual report on the rule of law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Reynas, and thanks for being with us. Um, now let's turn, re return to, to Ms. Adamovic um, about the, uh, hate, uh, hate speech and how to combat it. Uh, so, dear Sars, um, thank you very much for invitation for this conference and for taking up uh, such an important subject. So, um, without any doubt, the German presidency uh, of the Council begins at the difficult time. Uh, this requires unprecedented efforts from across the social, economic, and political spectrum. European values um, are under threat. Of course, the whole world has been trying to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. Um, however, um, in my opinion, one element is missing from the picture. Uh, I mean, support for democracy, and restoration of the civil rights and uh, fundamental freedom. So uh, we need uh, now more than ever in the EU an ambitious uh, multi-annual multi financial framework. It cannot be a budget based only on the economic recovery. The coming weeks will be uh, marked by crucial negotiations between EU member states in order to adopt MMF 2021 to 27 in due time, ahead uh, of the EU leaders' summer call for 17, 18 July, let me appeal to them to find the strength and uh, persistent to adopt the ambitious principle for MMF. Surely it will be a difficult task in the current situation, it is more difficult than it has ever been. However, we cannot focus only on post-pandemic economic recovery. The EU's next seven-year budget will define our approach to what is important. While saving the economy is at stake, we cannot lose a bigger picture. A defense of democracy needs to be one of our main priorities. Focusing just on saving the economy would be short-sighted. Um, therefore, we need also increase the social reliance and restore public trust in the state and its institution. Uh, and civil society is going to play a crucial role in this respect. The European civil society and independent media are going to be instrumental for full restoration of the EU fundamental values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. This post-pandemic recovery cannot make us lose our ambition in regard to support of democracy and upholding its values. Initiatives such as the uh, EU Democracy Action Plan, Media Action Plan, or Digital Service Act cannot be uh, downgraded due to other priorities. Finally, the proposed enormous cut to rights and values program 
cannot be accepted. It is precisely this EU program that it's supposed to uphold the EU fundamental values and support civil society and uh, grassroots organization. We cannot leave our civil society without resources uh, they uh, so desperately need. Let me also say a few words uh, on the issue of the fighting against hate speech. As you may be aware, it is an issue particularly dear to my heart. Hate speech can not only misinform people, but it can kill. Online hate speech and disinformation are increasingly used as a tool to increase, to increase social polarization and extend exploited for politician purpose. Combating them is not only relevant to the domain of human rights, it is also a fundamental factor in terms of the fine of the rule of law and democracy in the, in, uh, the EU. I would like to emphasize that I'm not talking only about the protection of media freedom, the, the fight against disinformation and hate speech as our moral duty. They are the very cornerstones of our defense of the democracy. The fight against media capture, hate speech, and misinformation, misinformation does not only concern the area of human rights, but it also becomes a major tax in the EU field of defense of the rule of law and the democracy in the EU, which is a major condition for survival of the EU. Allow me uh, also turn, uh, to remark that this appeal goes hand in hand with my previous argument regarding ambitious uh, financing and emphasizing on the initiatives uh, tackling threats to democracy and media freedom and pluralism. When we need, we need to be clear about our condemnation of hate speech. The climate of impunity in the digital sphere, um, a further increase in uh, damaging potential of online attacks and harassment. I'm very much aware of the criticism surrounding several legislative, initi legislative initiatives at the national level. They are criticized for trying to counter hate speech, but failing to adequately take freedom of expression into consideration. I would like to stress that we need to focus on the tension between justified freedom of expression and unjustified permissibility of hate speech. This is a crucial task for the EU in its work on the proposal for the G Digital Service Act. All our actions and legislations must absolutely take into account the protection of freedom of expression as one of the basic human rights. However, when the right to the freedom of speech is used as a tool for mass manipulation, leading to the um, uh, leading to the um, an element of democracy, it becomes the antithesis of, of freedom. Freedom can not be used to enslave. Democratic procedures cannot be used to destroy democracy. The remedy for using freedom of speech to manipulate society is to increase media freedom, independence and pluralism, access to information, including the protection of reliable journalists, and finally, support for media literacy. Those not only should be our priorities, they have to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Adamovic. Um, now let's open the floor to the questions and remarks from the audience. Um, Karzina Baranowska has collected the, um, um, your input and um, 
So thank you again for all the questions and comments. And uh, one of, of the topics that I would like to raise and address uh, to the panelists is the misunderstanding or the lack of understanding of the rule of law and the role that can be played by various actors. Uh, as uh, Judge Ulrich Majdowski said in the very beginning, there are some red lines with regard to the rule of law, uh, law, even if we look at it from different sides. And here, there is the role of lawyers, of public officials to engage with the public, to explain and to educate uh, about uh, certain issues. Um, and uh, let me start with uh, saying that uh, the, the um, author of the first question that I asked in the beginning, is safeguarding versus restoring the rule of law, was Professor Wojciech Sadurski, uh, who is a legal academic very involved in, in this action, engaging with the public and informing about the rule of law. Uh, Judge Wojciech Vrubel has explained how judges can be involved in uh, such uh, actions. And in fact, as we can see in Poland, in many uh, situations, this really is taking place and judges are very active in explaining uh, the peculiarities and also many details uh, concerning uh, the, the developments in Poland. Uh, Judge uh, Angelika Nussberger talked about how judges are responsible if they are misunderstood. And I think that's also a very strong statement today. Um, and in this panel, we also talked about uh, the um, role that local communities can play and national human rights institutes. Uh, so what I would like uh, to address uh, coming out of the questions from the audience is what role uh, national human rights institutes, judges, local institutions, uh, and governmental institutions can play in engaging with the public in the context of the rule of law. And some of you from the audience have raised uh, doubts uh, whether in the context of engaging in those actions, uh, the um, independence of those institutions is endangered. Uh, so I would like the panel to address also this, those uh, doubts, whether uh, they in fact are, um, um, are valid. Uh, and it would be great to get comments in particular about the institutions that you're representing, as well as judges who have been the, the topic of all of panels today. Thank you. Would you like to start? Um, yes, thank you. I, um, I would take up the question, what, can, what, what role do national human rights institutions have to engage with the public? Um, and I think Adam Bodnar rightly said, we need to um, make it um, clear to the public what the rule of law really means, what independence of the judiciary um, means. Um, and I think we can do that. Uh, if we, for example, um, we, we have to exemplify what the rule of law means. Um, let us take the corona pandemic that was referred to by a number um, of authors. Um, speaking from a German perspective, I would say that uh, what we have seen in the, in the corona pandemic is that independent courts stepped in to um, uh, uh, protect the population against overbroad governmental regulations, overbroad governmental measures. Um, and that is something that uh, I think was extremely important for my own country because it then helped us to direct the um, discussions on what exactly, how do we balance the protection against the corona pandemic with the other rights infringed through measures. So I think that is a, a, a clear cut case um, to, um, to show. And I think that is something we need to do um, in a better way to make it visible that independence of the judiciary is not something to protect judges for the sake of the judges but to protect all of us, um, really. And that is what we need to, um, to engage with. OK. I think that's a really interesting point you're raising there, because the corona pandemic has, has changed our perception of, of so many things. And, and this is one of them, probably. So Adam Bodnar, um, um, would you um, say that in Poland, the, the, the experience of the corona pandemic and, uh, has, has changed in some respect um, the perception of of the, uh, this whole um, independence of ju the judiciary uh, debate? Uh, I think that uh, it is too early to say it, uh, because for sure uh, there were a number of situations where uh, our rights have been restricted due to pandemic, uh, because the government didn't introduce the uh, extraordinary uh, state. Uh, but uh, it restricted different rights via ordinary regulations. But uh, it seems that sooner or later, most of those cases that result from those restrictions 
will go to court. So, for example, right now we observe a series of lawsuits uh, against state treasury for the compensation of damages. Uh, and those lawsuits are brought by uh, entrepreneurs. Or we observe that people are protesting against administrative penalties uh, imposed on them, and most of them would most probably go to courts. And I think it is a good opportunity to explain to the general public why independent courts are important in this context. And in my opinion, uh, what is needed, and it seems to me that it is not just a question of Poland, but it seems to me also of other EU member states, is just to spend a lot of time and energy into innovative and creative teaching and uh, education on the value of rule of law and on practical examples why independent courts and rule of law mechanisms are important for every uh, individual. In Poland, we have in this regard quite good examples, and I think the Judicial Association Justitia uh, cre created a number of uh, interesting uh, ideas or such initiatives like free courts, initiative which used extensively social media to promote the value of independent judiciary. But I think that we shouldn't stop at this. We shouldn't just stop uh, by using this education as just a tool of defending the current uh, situation or defending against those daily attacks and abuses. But we should still continue our effort and we should still promote our best practices to other EU member states. And obviously, if European Union is interested in investing into that kind of methods of uh, legal education or civic education, I think that should be the role of the EU. Right. Um, the, the question that was brought up um, um, initially um, was about not just the, the, the courts itself, not just the legal community, but uh, the, the, the political public at large. Um, Ms. Baran um, 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 Ms. Adamovic, um, in, in your view, um, would, would you say that the media and the, um, the, the public commentators um, in, in, in Europe on the, on the EU level um, is doing enough to, to raise awareness of, of, the, of the rule of law issues that we are facing right now? Um, Mr. Bodnar already referred um, wisely to education uh, initiatives, and uh, I cannot really agree more. Education is uh, fundamental. So uh, let me particularly highlight it in this um, regard, media literacy. We, uh, we have to teach not only young people, but all the uh, society uh, how to uh, understand the media and not to be manipulated. So, um, so uh, this is, uh, I mean, to, to support uh, the um, organization and uh, to support the organization and the um, remedy for using freedom of speech to, to manipulate uh, um, society is to increase media freedom, independence and pluralism and big access to uh, information and, um, and free journalism. These are the, the fundamental um, uh, cornerstones to this, to this issue. So the rule of, of media, uh, this is really the, the crucial uh, uh, for us and for education. And you must support uh, support free uh, media, and we need uh, um, financing uh, for that. And uh, the other thing is the digital uh, literacy cannot be any more uh, any more cannot be any more considered uh, as an additional skill. This is just the skill that everyone uh, needs to have. The modern citizens of of European Union. They need to have these this, this skills, and uh, if uh, if we will be aware, um, I think we can defend ourselves um, from this manipulation, fake news, and uh, not to let uh, be divided. Thank you very much.
Well, let's hear more from, from the audience. We think have another uh, input. So let me ask uh, two more questions, uh, more specific questions about the reaction to uh, two um, um, developments that are taking place. So first of all uh, is the development of hate speech, in particular online hate speech, also with regard to minorities. Uh, and here the question concerned uh, both the reaction of uh, the states and in particular what Germany and its presidency can, um, can, can take place and whether that is going to be uh, of uh, focus. And the second uh, question concerns reaction to um, so-called LGBT-free zones uh, in Poland uh, and what the reactions of local communities can be uh, and of uh, national, um, 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 uh, national institutions as well and how any discrimination in those uh, zones can be um, um, acted against. Thank you. Thank you. I think the first question would be to you, Ms. Speck. And the second, probably to Adam Bodnar, or whoever wants to comment on that one as well. And I'd ask you to be brief, because we have to um, come to, uh, to an end. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I will be very brief. And um, I would like to thank all the other panelists for making their cases so strong. I think they're very good ideas and also support for what I elaborated on at the very beginning, what we plan in our EU Council presidency. We will work very closely with the Commission um, on the annual rule of law report and just maybe coming back to the earlier question Ms. Baranowska um, uh, uh, mentioned, um, to have a follow-up and really to have a broad discussion. I think that's what the Commission intends and that's something that will also happen um, in Germany. National Parliament, the Bundestag is very interested in the annual rule of law report. Um, and it is, it is an occasion to discuss the report broadly um, and, uh, and, and also focusing on developments all over Europe in each and every member state, not only at, um, at EU level, but also at national level. So in the parliaments, in the lender, but also with civil society. As for your point, um, Mrs. Adamovich, that you made very strong in the MFF negotiations, I think, I think conditionality of rule, of, rule of law is really in a and priority for the German government, and we would like to make sure that we really have a strong, um, a strong um, uh, model established. Um, and, as, and we very much support the Commission in its position to have a um, to install a reverse qualified majority to really set the threshold very high. Um, as far as um, hate speech is concerned and the developments of hate speech and also disinformation, I can, I can um, confirm that this is also another t priority for the German government. We will discuss hate speech um, in the EU, also focus on, uh, on developments as far as anti-Semitism is concerned. We would really like to establish a network to um, exchange information um, um, more about developments in um, several and uh, different member states and really to create awareness of the developments and trends that we can see. Um, and we could also see during the crisis and, um, and as, a, as a result of the crisis. Um, as far as this information is concerned, um, um, it is very much the same. We would like to hold a conference to really broadly discuss this information, especially in the internet, um, and also to work on um, coming up with council conclusions to make a strong case for um, preventing disinformation to seeing how the EU, um, what the EU can do at different levels to um, protect um, uh, pr to protect society from disinformation and to really counter fake news. And I think the past weeks and also during the crisis, we are a very good example and really triggered again how important it is to address this issue. So thank you very much. Can I only say two sentences? Answer to the second question. Can I only add two sentences? Of, of, of course, of course. Go yeah, on. so um, I would like to, to point out that the one who is responsible for breaking of rule of law in Poland, this is our governing party. So we cannot really punish the citizens, the social society, um, by, um, by, by, uh, be, because of them. So uh, we have to remember, and uh, when we will uh, take into consideration some mechanism, we have to construct them in that way that, that we punished the really someone who, 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 is, who is responsible for that. Because Poles, Polish people, 
they are not really guilty for for what the government is doing. Thank you. Uh, Adam, it seems the work. Uh, it's your turn. It seems it's now my turn to to answer. Yes, Maximilian, am I right? Uh, yeah. So I would like to uh, to try to answer those two questions concerning uh, fighting hate speech uh, and especially fighting hate speech online. I think there is like one interesting opportunity that comes up during the German presidency, which is the work on the uh, so-called DSA package, which is Digital Services Act package. Why is it so? Because uh, it is this moment when uh, European Union may really do a lot in order to regulate uh, content, which is provided on different uh, social platforms uh, and social media uh, networks. And for example, in Poland, we have this problem that there is a discrepancy between provisions concerning protection against hate speech and protection of different discriminated grants. So for example, LGBT persons are not protected uh, uh, as such against hate speech, while racial or ethnic minorities or groups or religious communities are protected. And some people are saying that, okay, because there is like this discrepancy, it means that we can do more when it comes to homophobic hate speech. And it seems to me that if the European Union considers inserting all those grants against hate speech that are included in Article 19 of the Treaty on, on Functioning of the European Union, that could be like a really positive element because it would give some additional impetus to restrict hate speech uh, with, within those different social media platforms. Uh, so I think uh, like connecting DSA negotiations uh, with the hate speech is, uh, I think, something important that could be uh, done in this context and just to move forward the European Union law uh, agenda in this, uh, in this respect. When it comes to the um, LGBT ideology, uh, so-called free zones, uh, you know, it's quite a complicated process and it's quite difficult to explain just in, in a couple of, of sentences. But I would like to say that I think the most important measure to fight against it is to support organizations and civil society actors that are representing and fighting for rights of LGBTI persons. Such organizations like Campaign Against Homophobia, like Lambda Warsaw, they really know what to do and how to fight and how to get to the local audience, how to get to stakeholders uh, in this regard. Second point is that I think this le recent letter by the commission that funding can be cut to those uh, local authorities that are not supporting uh, discrimination, th that are not supporting uh, the principle of non-discrimination due to sexual orientation, it is really something important because it is like this very practical example of uh, combining uh, European values with like real uh, issues of uh, cooperation. Uh, even two days ago, I was participating in a webinar organized by the uh, LGBTI interparliamentary group within the European Parliament, and we discussed uh, about this. But I think uh, it's really uh, something presidential, something important, and it seems to me that this letter had an effect on the discourse at the local level. And finally, I would like to say that uh, being the Ombudsman, uh, I have this possibility to challenge different local laws uh, to administrative courts, and in the middle of uh, July, We'll have first hearing before first hearings before regional administrative courts concerning those resolutions of local uh, governmental units. So let's see what Polish courts will do with those uh, resolutions. I do hope that uh, courts will say that basically they are contrary not only to the EU law but also to the Polish uh, constitution. And maybe we'll, ba we'll basically will stop the process of adopting new resolutions of that kind of that kind, because in my opinion, they are simply shameful and they never should, uh, should be adopted on the Polish uh, ground. Thank you very much. Madam Bodna, behind the rules. Yes, I, I simply wanted to take up a question that Dr. Baranowska had reported from the discussions, namely that doubts were ex uh, expressed whether 
the independence of the judiciary really is uh, endangered. Um, and to that, my response is clear. Um, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the European Court of Human Rights, the Venice Commission, they all have concluded um, that uh, there were serious, that there are serious violations of the independence of the judiciary, and they've come to that um, under, uh, after close scrutiny. So my uh, 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 assessment, therefore, is, of course, you can disagree with those uh, findings, but if you disagree, you disagree with the fundamental European values that are at the basis of those findings. We've come to an end. Thank you very much. Um, I return the floor to our host. Yeah. Geben Sie mir noch sozusagen. Yes, thank you. Please uh, give me uh, the opportunity to share two things with you. The first thing is I would like to express my warmest thanks for your patient listening and watching wherever you were. Uh, these were over three hours for an online forum. This is really quite a long time. At the same time, we would like to express our thanks to everyone who joined uh, staging this, as those who, uh, who joined the panel, the discussion as moderators. I think this was very helpful, and it's uh, very valuable that you took the time to do that. And my special thanks, uh, we should not forget that we worked in three uh, languages. So thanks to the translators who are with us here in this room who uh, allowed us uh, to um, uh, understand each other across borders. In the end, I also want to thank our colleagues from the office of the uh, uh, Polish um, Ombudsman, um, uh, Minister for Human Rights, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bodmar, and uh, uh, also Mr. Tabarowski. So we hope for continued good cooperation between our two human rights institutions. Also, I want uh, to recall the great commitment in our own, uh, Mrs. Sonnenberg, Mrs. Schäfer, Mr. Stelzer, in our own institute. That is, uh, they, these people, this team was very committed, and thanks a lot for that. And also Mrs. Young. So my uh, second thought, uh, Mr. Bovenschuld reached out to me. You may recall, actually, our host who could not participate due to technical issues. And he um, sent us uh, a video message, uh, which we will uh, uh, upload on the YouTube uh, channel of the German Institute for Human Rights. There you can read what he said. But I'd like to emphasize four of his central thoughts, which uh, are very important for him and also for Bremen and our commitment for a liberal democracy and the rule of law. The first one is the central importance of rule of law and liberal democracy should always be recalled. Dr. Bovenschub himself is a lawyer and uh, by training and he points out how central that is for our own democratic institutions. He pointed, and this is his th second thought, he pointed out that uh, some years ago we would not have thought about rule of law as a topic, but that we have to do that now because democracy and political stability have long been seen as inalienable uh, uh, facts, but now have to be defended again. The political tonality changed in this context. The climate has become rougher. Societies uh, too easily drift apart uh, socially and politically. We have to work on that. The third thought is a political counter uh, movement also comes from cities and communities, which send out signals for liberal democratic developments and can do that. And in this context, he wanted to point out that he sends a very a warm virtual greeting from Bremen to Danz because this is one expression of this collaboration. And at the end, uh, he said the liberal uh, constitutional state is so important because fundamental rights and procedural rights are guaranteed, especially also because it guarantees these rights to vulnerable people from minorities of different religion and different sexual orientation. These are those who really need the, the, the uh, state of law, not just those who are quite well off and uh, moving in the mainstream. I think these are very important thoughts of Mr. Bumchud I wanted to share with you. Now, uh, wrapping up, I would like to wish all of you that you continue to have a good day, and we hope that we could, out, could send out important signals with this event. We invite you to have another look at it when you can't be uh, with us uh, all the time. It's on the YouTube channel of our institute. You may as well share the stream with colleagues and friends where you think this makes sense. And you may as well listen to the statement of Mr. Bovenschulte. So my warmest thanks for your long attention, and I hereby close the meeting. Thank you.